Okay, great. Hello, everyone, and welcome to XYZ Masterclass on VFX in today's international audiovisual production landscape. The panelists will define the key roles in VFX production, break down the production pipeline, and share experiences and professional viewpoints in the world of VFX. This masterclass is the fourth of the year and at least the 10th in a row that Film Tampere proudly organizes together with Los Angeles-based XYZ Films. But most importantly, this masterclass is created in collaboration with Tampere University of Applied Sciences, VFX Artist Specialization Education. <clears throat> Tamp has made history in Finnish film education by making the first VFX artist specialization education in Finland. So congratulations, Tamp, for amazing work. That's truly fantastic. The masterclass is funded by European Union Next Generation EU. So big thanks go to the Ministry of Education and Culture and the Ministry of Employment and Economics for making this masterclass possible. Thank you so much. <clears throat> but good audience, now I have the pleasure to introduce our fantastic panelists. From Tampere-based Troll VFX, we have the CEO and executive producer Antti Kulmala and Elin Laven, VFX artist. Welcome very much. And, and from U Media VFX from Belgium, Brussels, we have Sol Solene Colin. Welcome. Thank you. Our dear partner, Arandra Chaikian, the producer and the co founder of XYZ Films, will be moderating this conversation. Thank you so much, panelists. Panelists, on behalf of uh, Film Tampere, for participating in this masterclass. We are truly very glad to have you here uh, today. Before we start, <clears throat> for the audience to know, this masterclass will be recorded and the recording will be sent to your emails afterwards. Uh, I will open the Q&I session approximately quarter or 10 past 8 Finland time, so please don't hesitate <clears throat> to ask questions and share comments when the time is. I'm Fanny Heinonen from Film Tampere and I wish you all a great masterclass. See you in the end of the session, please, Aram. Thank you, Fani, for the for the kind words and great intro. Really appreciate it. Um, hello, everybody. Moi, my name is Anam Tertsakian. I'm a co-founder at LA-based XYZ Films. Uh, we are, by way of background, we are a uh, independent studio based here in LA um, who works a lot internationally. And we are currently working and have worked with both of the companies and panelists that we will be talking to today. Um, we, XYZ's relationship with Finland spans back several years. We uh, produced the film Duel, um, which was shot in the fall of 2020, starring Aaron Paul and Karen Gillan, which was the, my understanding, the first American film shot entirely in Finland. So we're quite proud of that. Um, had his premiere in Sundance at the film festival earlier this year and has since enjoyed a successful release. Um, we're also in post-production on a, a large uh, scale Netflix action film called Havoc starring Forrest Whitaker and Tom Hardy, uh, with which we're doing a sizable portion of the VFX with Troll um, and Tampere. So the, the connections run deep. And as Fani mentioned, this is uh, an ongoing collaboration with uh, Film Tampere, Business Finland and European Union Next Generation. So thank you all. It's our last masterclass of the year, but first and many more to come. Uh, going into 2023, but it's a uh, it's a true pleasure and honor to continue working on uh, on these master classes and working with our esteemed colleagues and guests. And thank you guys as a panelist for coming on board today and generously sharing your time and expertise. And on that note, I'd love to to hand it off to you guys to just take a couple minutes to introduce yourselves, uh, where you are, your roles, and give the audience a little bit more context about you. Um, why don't we start with Auntie from Troll? Okay, thank you, Aram. So, hello, everybody. My name is Antti Kulmala. Uh, I'm the CEO and executive producer of Troll VFX. And my background for the industry comes from, from offline editing. 
So I started 2000 approximately editing commercials and music videos and here in the Finnish market and also abroad at that time. And then after several years working here in Finland, I moved to Toronto and I worked there for, for three years. And during that time, I would say that my, my interest toward VFX started to gain quite a lot. It's it's like uh, theater production is a little bit different if we are talking about many commercials. It's it's after the shoot they let the director go, and after that, the offline editor takes the lead. It becomes pretty much like the director of the post production. So I had an assistant, and we organize all the VFX, color grading, all that stuff. And at that point, at that point, I started to be more interested about about VFX. And and after three years working there, I moved to Finland and and. One of the biggest films, Iron Sky, CGI wise, was just finished here in Finland. I wasn't any part of that, but then there was an amazing opportunity to to take the lead of Troll VFX, and it was a brand new company. And now we have been up and running for what would I say, eleven years approximately, and and being lucky nowadays to work more and more in a bigger and bigger projects, and and mainly mainly on long format TV series and movies. And we still do some commercial, but it's it's minority in our pipeline at the moment. But that's pretty much me in a nutshell. Yeah. Thank you for that, Auntie. Then thanks for coming on board today. Let's move on next. Also from Troll is Eileen, and Eileen love to hear a little bit more about you and your background and and your role at the company. Yes. All right. So. I came to Troll uh, about half a year ago from having almost 10 years in this business now. Um, I started out as an intern at a Swedish company called Important Looking Pirates. And at this moment, they were around 20 people or something. So I started as this little intern that did a little bit of everything. And as this company grew and as I grew, I kind of found my niche, which was within the look development and texturing and lighting. and sort of just went on from there. And I did a little bit of, uh, I went to MPC in London for a brief time and I worked at Pinkman TV, which made the uh, Love, Death and Robots projects. Uh, yeah, and then I decided I kind of miss being at a small place where you are very hands-on. And Troll found me <laughs> before I even, even started like looking, looking. So that was very, very good. Uh, so here I am now, we call it 3D lead. So my focus is that uh, I'm keeping my eyes on, you know, the light team and the, all the look dev asset teams and all that stuff and also leading a project currently. Also while I'm doing light. So I'm rendering and doing that stuff still. That's about it, I guess. <laughs> cool, cool, cool. And, and last but not least, um from uh from Belgium Solene uh from U Media a company that XYZ has had the the honor of working on on several films with from I Kill Giants to the Nicolas Cage cult classic Mandy which if anybody in the audience hasn't seen I highly recommend checking out um Solene why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and give us a little bit about your background sure so um <clears throat> I'm coming from France uh, I uh, studied there in uh, cinema school in in Nantes, where I had the the chance to um, to to have an overview on all um, different role uh, about filmmaking. I say so was editing, but also the the all jobs turning around the images, and then also the the production. Sorry. Uh, so then I have done as well a, a hard school and then I start working in, in Paris for a big commercial company uh, named uh, Vanda, uh, where basically uh, they were doing all the, the L'Oreal or Dior or, or with uh, Charlie Theron, for example, uh, uh, all this kind of uh, uh, big projects. And actually I was working there uh, in production like pure production let's say uh, then I moved to post-production so it was more following the editing sounds grading uh, and then it was really frustrating for me to uh, not handling and and follow all the work uh, in VFX 
So uh, during a film festival, I had the chance to uh, meet the HR from uh, Umedia, uh, where I started as a VFX production coordinator. And now I'm a VFX producer. So basically I'm um, working hand by hand with the uh, VFX supervisor uh, to, to make uh, things durable in terms of uh, budget and schedule. Uh, so it can go to uh, building the team with HR, but also uh, start working on a financial follow-up to see uh, where things are, are going day by day, uh, following the fabrication as well to, to see if we still stay in, in the square. <laughs> Uh, and also ensure that the, the, the client is happy and uh, um, we, we can have their uh, all, the maximum idea they have uh, uh, in, uh, in the time uh, we, we, we have. Um, so, yeah, that's it. That's great. So thank you, guys. Thank you all. And, and I want to start with a you sort of answered it, but I also want to get a little more specific because we have a lot of students, um, thankfully, in the audience today who are probably at a, a point of deciding which route they want to go. And we have a VFX producer here, a VFX artist, and also a an executive producer and CEO. And I'd love for each of you guys to take you know a minute or two and just talk about what how you would define that role in in your life. So you know, starting with Eileen as an artist you know what is your what is your your path what is your it, it could be you know what do you do from morning to night or it could be what is your goal project to project but just to give especially for people who are thinking about starting a career as a vfx artist what does that exactly mean and what does that feel and look like um well my part of the whole vfx part is very much the creative part not necessarily the most technical even though you know it's always technical to some extent. Um, for me, it's uh, it's the part where you get everything from any other department. Uh, as lighters, for example, we are scene assemblers. Whatever is going to be in this scene that we're going to hand to comp, which is the last step step when they get the rendered 2D pictures. Um, but that's on the lighters table. So they bring in the animations, they bring in the shaders, and they create light. But then you also bring in, for example, FX could be explosions, snow, and so on. So it's really like, uh, it's a very, very social work because you have to be in close contact with every department and also in the end, make everything look good and together. And especially when you are uh, matching a plate, like a, a footage that are taken on set, you need the light to be spot on. And that's also like, it's a very fun challenge uh, Especially like you usually get like little gray balls and things. They they have that there. So you can like look at what direction the lights are coming from and like how warm is the light and things like that. Um, what I would recommend, what I usually recommend students that are going into VFX is to start as generalists. Uh, because if you start as a very strict, if you have a very strict idea of what you want to do and you end up on a big studio and you do just that that might be what you get stuck with but if you begin at a smaller company as a big generalist you will probably most likely like me find your way as you walk forward like as you move forward and this is what i always tell students because it's too early to know what you really want to do i thought i wanted to be an animator i'm very happy i didn't end up there i love light and look at them <laughs> And one thing I would like to add to Ellen is like, that's all true. And, it's, and I agree with that, that to uh, do, do pretty much everything, be general. It's like, that is the path if you want to kind of kind of gain in your career and be, become a supervisor or producer or whatever it's like, because in that way, you learn at least something from everything. And it, I, I think it's extremely important. And it was well, really well said that. Yeah, but I agree with you because exactly like if you have done a little bit of everything that necessarily doesn't mean you have to be remember how you did that but it's very easy to communicate with your team if you mm. know how it's sort of made you know like it's not just a question mark and you 
it's nice yeah. to have an idea of how stuff works. Yeah, and it's easier to find your path, like what Definitely. you want to do eventually. Yeah. Oh, yes. There's a, there's a saying in the US that you don't want to be a jack of all trades and a master of none. But I think in, in the film production space, it's exactly what you want to be. Uh, <laughs> to begin yeah, with, but, at least. Yeah, yeah <laughs> no, beginning. exactly. Yeah, that's good. And you yeah. can become a master of something along the way. But I think that being a jack of all trades, a generalist, as, as you said, Aline, at the beginning, is is really useful because you number one you learn what you don't like and what you're not interested in number two you gain an appreciation for that because you see that other people are doing something that maybe doesn't come to you naturally number three you understand the landscape a lot better and and the pipelines and workflows to see who's doing what and then exactly. number four it allows you to to get a better sense of what you are interested in and then to eventually become a master of that so you know, I think that that's really good advice for starting off as a generalist and then feeling it out from there. Um, uh, so Lynn, so talk to us about what your your path as a VFX producer. So, you know, I, not you spoke a little bit about your background, but the the difference between an artist and a producer, speak a little bit about that and and what, you know, how you interact with the artists and then also how you interact with the clients as as somebody who's not strictly in the artistic space focusing on, you know, making sure each shot gets gets done? Uh, well, actually, it deep, like my role can depend about how big is the, the project, because as soon as a project gets bigger, bigger, you can have then project manager and project coordinator. So we are more or less in the same family, but basically split the, the work in, in, in a different way. But let's say that in general, um, our role in, in production in VFX is uh to uh, to um to, to follow uh all steps of fabrication and see where are we going basically and also make sure that the artists have everything they need in the time uh, and um and um make some um I'm gonna say that like um, we work with deadlines. We work a lot uh, with uh, a short grid. I don't know if uh, students already uh, had the opportunity to to have a look on this, but uh, this is our Bible a bit, where we put all informations, and uh, it helps us to 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 drive the team. Basically, it's to um, yeah follow follow everyone and be sure we can be here if. There is anything a uh, technical issue or uh, something missing a brief uh, artistic brief which is not really clear or uh, some um, demands from the clients retakes or validations uh, we are really the 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 center of the communication between clients and then what it's happened inside basically to to make the 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 car drive let's say um so yes and to 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 join a bit what's uh Elin said um in production size i feel like the best is to start with small or medium uh companies so it will give you as well more um, um, opportunities to do different things as well in in production because as I said as the um, the project is bigger then you have all everyone really specified so can you you can easily be a coordinator just on a department uh, which is I think interesting, but also nice to see all departments of the, the VFX and all the pipelines. So then when you're a producer as well, and you talk with uh, your um, VFX supervisor, you know what uh, um, what he can have in mind when he thinks about how to, to do um, a shot. And you already have the, the, the idea of who's doing what and what they need. Uh, so yeah, I think it's a good uh, good point when you start there like this that's really helpful thank you thank you Selene. um and then auntie your your role slightly different so you've you've had background as an artist and as as a as a technician you're now working in a role where you're an executive producer across projects but also ceo of a company 
Um, and I'm sure there's people in the audience, both working professionals and students who, who might have that kind of interest as well. Can you speak a little to, you know, what, what that looks like for you? I'm sure it's a combination of trying to figure out how to run the company and set the strategy and goals while also trying to figure out how to find business and bring in new opportunities, which is love to hear more about what, what that looks like for you. And, um, you know, sort of the pros and cons of getting away from some of the artistry and more into some of the business and strategy. Yeah. So my role is pretty much is like trying to lure the clients in. It's like I, I'm usually I'm the first contact with uh, with the production company. If I meet producers or executive producers or production company owners or VFX executives from from the streamers. So, yeah, that's pretty much my job at the moment. It's like, of course, I, I I'm responsible of the company's finance side also and how, how the money is spent in the productions. Uh, I, I get a lot of help from our production manager and from the producers of course they they run the daily stuff and they report everything to me and it's like I'm, I'm the final yes or no pretty much in a production but i i think it's like i also want to give quite a lot of trust to to companies employees so they have like a free way of doing things and of course they get responsibilities also and but that's pretty much like, I don't know which side, CEO or executive producer, but is that, I, I think it's like as a CEO and trying, I see also that one of my main roles is to get clients in and new clients. I'm, I'm the person who shakes the hands in the beginning and in the end, if everything goes well. And if, if the famous thing happens in between, then I have to step in and start talking with the production. If something goes wrong, if everything goes extremely well, then, they don't, I don't usually hear anything about the production. It's like it's just going smoothly and everybody's happy. But it also means that I had to leave creative side behind quite a lot. It's like I don't want to be on that part anymore because we have extremely talented people who are handling that extremely nicely. So for me, it means that I do travel quite a lot because most of our clients nowadays come, come from abroad. So I, I go through VFX events uh film festivals meeting people face to face try to try to get new clients every day and yeah that's pretty much it very cool very cool um so to switch gears and to it goes on to with what you were saying but i'd love to hear from from all of you guys um but especially the Finns, about the the difference in the the experience workflow um and, and and just general sort of um i guess pipeline process of local domestic productions working on vfx on a finnish film or or in your case um so in like a, a belgian or french film versus international films working with you know producers from australia or the us or canada or places you know, near and far who, who are relying on you guys to deliver it. It'd be interesting to hear more about, is it is it easier when it's a, a local project? Is it harder when it's a local project? What are the ups and downs that come with those? Uh, you know, and it, it's a, it's, it feels like it's a shrinking marketplace uh, in a good way where everybody can get on a Zoom like we're doing right now and chat, but it also feels like I'm sure the expectations and, and workflows are quite different from country to country and from international versus domestic or local product. So I'll open that up to all you guys, whoever wants to answer, because you're yeah. all having different experiences. I can start yeah. if it's okay. Yep. Yeah. So I, I think it's like, uh, if I compare, let's say, uh, I don't know if it's like a, working with big streamer or Nordic Nordic uh, productions, I think it's it's has been really nice to see that they are coming closer to each other. It's like, it's starting to, re not remotely, but it's starting to remind each other. Because I think in the first place, the bigger bigger difference was that uh, in a local project, there's all this kind of like beginning and end. And then there's something in between. You know, it's like there is no rhythm. There's no like standards in a way. It's like if we are working with streamer, there is meetings every week, no matter if we have anything to say or not. It's like, but we have the meeting. You no, know? and of course, because the budgets are bigger, if you go, international projects there is more people involved you know tech checking is way more challenging and 
there is different like uh, how would I say it, aspects of production. You know, there is, of course because there's so many people. But uh, I would also say that nowadays that we have what we have worked with the local projects, they are starting to remind pretty closely. You know, to the bigger productions also, but it's 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 the scale is of course it's it's a little bit smaller, but it's it's nice to see that they are going the same direction. And I think there's a lot of help that we have. Most of our production people, also producers, uh, line producers, they have they have they are familiar with international projects and they have work in those, so it helps a lot. And so it's it's becoming more international inside of the Finnish borders in a way. It was great. So it feels to you like more and more the 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 two processes are I'm not going to say indistinguishable, but that they're very much in line and and going yeah, in the same direction. They, yeah, they are going yeah. to the same direction. And of course, we it's 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 like it's not a bad thing. We are we are going uh, walk or we are following like few step few steps behind production wise, but we are going the right direction. And I think that's the most important thing. Is like. We can't fill all the roles because, and it's usually it's a budget issue, not issue, but challenge. So that's how it goes. And I think it will be like that pretty much forever, but still the, the production can be same in a way. You know, you know what I mean? It's like the form is the same and, and we are doing the same things. Like we, are, we have, what I say, weekly checks for the, for the shots, what we have done and how we have proceeded, but it doesn't, necessarily mean that there has been like a giant leap for for what we have done but still there is like the rhythm of the production is becoming the same as in the international production so Lenny, has it been your experience as well do you feel like uh you know working on on local um local product whether that's you know french belgium uh closer to closer to where you are and closer to what you sort of came up with versus I don't know Hollywood or China or or anywhere in between places that are near and far that do things differently. As a VFX producer, do you feel like you see a big difference in those workflows and pipelines, or do you feel like they look pretty similar? What are what would you say are the biggest differences and similarities? Uh, well, actually, I'll say that for for sure the the project we will do here you you feel of course a bit more like home because you used to know the other persons in the other companies and you know that you can straight away jump to the editing room or the to, to help a bit the, the director sometimes to make some decision or also go to a grading station uh, so you feel a bit more like uh, part of uh, the, the, the all the process let's say uh, rather than, of course, when it's more international, it could be a bit more complicating with uh, the different, uh, uh, well, first the, the, the distance, but also, also the, the time zone sometimes. Uh, but the thing I like with the international uh, projects is I feel like you, you learn a lot as well. A every project is different. And uh, there is so many companies that it's not um yeah you, you most of the time you work with different people every time uh and they all have their work to to work sometimes so you have as well to adapt uh your yourself a bit and i think that it's at this point sometimes you can uh, find some uh some little challenges and uh feel like uh, it's nice too Nice. And Elaine, as a as a VFX artist, are you finding are you finding that you're dealing with artists all over the world and um and and having any kind of like cultural or um or you know no, I mean, or, or does it feel like it's all pretty tight and everybody's on the same page? Yeah, I mean, as an artist, I don't uh, feel that much of a difference really since you know my issue is not the client's time zone because i don't uh, usually discuss stuff with them, those they they look at uh, my stuff at another point and you know uh, what i think though um is that you know it's very like just a few years ago when you compared like for example big hollywood movies versus uh, swedish or i'm gonna say swedish because i'm actually swedish but swedish or finnish movies and so on 
you can you could tell very clearly you know there is a smaller budget on the Swedish one version versus the big Hollywood one but that's the cool thing that is like now it's I also agree but on the creative part that they are stepping up like all the local uh, yeah around here we're literally working on a project now where it's um, shot with LED screens around the studio just like they did in Mandalorian and it looks really really nice and the plates are you know like everything is like filmed so nicely the footage is so crisp and good nowadays and the only thing I wish you know is that they could uh, shoot a little bit of reference like they're learning you can tell they're learning <laughs> so sometimes there's a lack of references of yes the light on set but except for that it's like yeah that's one step away and it's going to be hard to tell them apart. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Uh, guys, just to shift gears and talk a little bit about technology, which is way outside of my outside of my wheelhouse. But what do you guys see as, you know, the the future of, of VFX technology in the in the next five years? And I ask that from my little bit of experience, you know, seeing more of the game engines coming into play. Um, you know, I've seen it on our film Havoc. Uh, you know, there's there's companies like Unity um, and Unreal Engine that that have brought some interesting things to the table. There's, um, you know, there's it seems like there's more freeware out there. What do you, this could be a question for all of you or, or just whoever feels the most comfortable, but what do you guys see as, um, is there a game-changing software or, or software process in the next few years that's going to make things either um, easier or or harder for you guys in in the sense of uh, you know technology that's either easier to access or or more less proprietary and makes it more competitive out there in the landscape because other people can do the same thing. Yeah, I can start because I'm the less technical person here. <laughs> so, but well, what I what I'm most interested about in the future in the VFX is AI. It's like how how we gonna how we gonna use that? It's gonna yeah. be extremely interesting. It's like like you see the AI art nowadays in Instagram. Everybody everyone can do that, and it, it looks amazing. It's like what it means to concept art and and like pre production and animation and all that stuff is like when it's gonna be the day that AI is animating like eighty to ninety percent of the animations, and then the artist will jump in and do the rest, the most challenging part. But that's that's the most interesting thing for me in the future. So, yeah. Yeah, and if I can uh, add a little something, that makes the, the work as well a bit more complicated for us, I feel, because it's so easy now to just take your smartphone and have a layer looking older, for example, than now. <laughs> Sometimes when you, you have to do these effects, it's hard to say no. Well, when you do it properly on, on VFX, it takes way more time than <laughs> just uh, some a, a tool we can put just like this. And uh, yeah, it, it can open, yeah, some... Uh, challenges and and uh, way to to explain as well like for the moment we are completely working different so you can't compare uh, the, the same things but yeah it's going to be interesting to see how uh, this will uh, evolve for sure yeah I, I agree that ai seems like a, a really big space you know it seems like everybody's working on everything from moving mouse for dubbing to to just creating entire worlds with AI and and onto to your point with what people are even doing on Instagram, just playing around with sketches, you know, it feels like that's something that could that could be a place and a space that students out there want to be paying attention to because it feels like that that could be a very big compliment. Obviously, competition with, but more of a compliment to what these companies are already doing in the VFX space and potentially helping to streamline. Um, uh, one thing yeah. before, sorry, Ellen, before you want to share your thoughts maybe but it's like I also want to say to the students that uh, no one should be afraid of AI you know even though if it does let's say 60 percent of the of the shot it's usually the most boring part of what they do so I think it's going to be a great opportunity for uh, future artists also that they can actually actually make the part of the VFX shot or CG shot that makes the whole difference that finalizes the whole thing. You know, and it could affect also to to schedules and all that stuff 
and how we work generally, but it it won't. Uh, I, I wouldn't say that it won't like it won't replace the artist. They they are still needed for sure, and that's that's absolutely. I think it's the it's the fact it could make make artist life a little bit easier. Yeah, and uh, ex if we like take the whole AI and the deep fake and all that out of the picture, what I find interesting is like, sure, programs are better. We can, they are helping us to do much more realistic things and it's better. But I mean, that being said, nothing is faster really today because you have gotten the tools to make stuff more beautiful, but that also needs heavier, like stronger machines. And, you know, you're going to do the, t you're going to go do details that you couldn't do 10 years ago. So it's like, I have seen programs uh, evolve quite a lot, you know, in 10 years and there's new renders and everything, but our render times, they remain the same because they look nicer now. But it's, you know, when you go up in quality, then the, you need more machine power. And so it's like, I feel like a lot of programs just evolved to make it possible to make stuff nicer, but it's always a huge amount of work. It's just that you can do more of it now. I think it's, it's like if you compare it to like way back when everything was done practical and everybody thought that, uh, VFX is going to change everything. It's like, I, I think we still spend at least the same amount of time when they were building like actual massive sets. You know, it yeah. takes time. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I mean, then they were scared of what we're doing now. And now we are a little bit nervous about AI. It's just, yeah. I guess we're just going to see what happens. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't see a, I don't see a negative side to, you know, deep fakes. So we don't have to look at those uh, CG animated human faces. Then it's like, it's nice to have an actor behind that little deep fake face. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, okay. So I, I want to ask you guys to, to flip gears. So we have some university students in the house and they are, uh, you know, studying VFX artistry, figuring out where they want to go from here. Um, what what advice would you give to them in terms of you know whether they're in in Tampere or Helsinki or uh, or looking to travel and work elsewhere? What can they do to to take what they've been learning academically and you know even if it's from the most modest way in you know I'm sure that can be a daunting thing for students. I remember as a student myself, you know the idea of like going from academia to to actually working in the industry, what kind of advice would you give? Obviously, the, the general thing that we talked about earlier is great, but where where does somebody even start to try to to figure out uh, how to get this kind of call it on set or or in studio experience to try to to try to learn how to do this? And and troll, this is not a question for you to go hire fifteen or twenty students. Uh, more more of more of what would you recommend to them in, in terms of how to get their foot in the door generally in the industry as opposed to specifically with you guys? I would say, well, after you got your foot in the door, I guess, but uh, it's like you never stop learning. Never. I, I, my, like 95% of what's going to be learned is going to happen during an internship and all the time thereafter. So it's like always make sure to... Like, don't let that ego come in the way. Keep asking questions. Be a team player. And yeah, you. that would be my biggest tip. Like, that's everyone loves a team player. And if you ask, you learn. Makes you a good artist. Hmm. I, I would say also that it don't be afraid to go abroad to see different studios and learn their way of working because it's always, always nice to see things from the different perspective and and don't be afraid of going abroad. It's like I, in general, is saying I, I would say that the VFX, if you could call it family, is pretty polite and nice. You know, it's it's. It, of course, you need to work hard if you want to be good at this job or a good artist. But it's, 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 it's a nice family to be in. And are there? Are, are there both you media and, and troll not specifically for you guys but for you guys and for other companies are there like um internship programs or or uh, artist training programs or things like that uh you know specifically again I'm, I'm not trying to get the the 20 students in the crowd to get jobs with you guys overnight but 
you know, more about where are there message boards that they should be looking at? Are there are there people who they should be talking to? What, what is the what is the way to translate? Okay, I I have certain skills and and I think I can do this to actually, you know, whether it's working as an intern or uh, a PA and even just delivering coffee, but being around people who are working in VFX. What what is the I, I guess in Finland specifically, but also in in the Ubedia space, what is the way that sort of new trainees and and people actually make their presence felt and show up and are able to to walk through that door? So I would just say that send emails, make yourself heard. It's like that's really much how how I started everything when I wanted to go abroad. It's like you, at that time we didn't have websites yet, so I was sending DVDs to editing companies, and I managed to get one of the best ones in Toronto. And it was like I was first uh, rep by company from New York, just by sending DVDs. So just be brave and contact people. I think that's that's the key thing. Is like, what's the worst thing that, that could happen? Is like someone is not replying your email, then you send a new one, and it's just like, yeah, yeah. I love that. I love that. And, and as a second part follow up question to that, again to the students, and I, I know we're, we're, we're it's not only students in our crowd, so I have some other questions for for some of the other producers and and more established folks. But um, in, in your guys' opinions across the board here. Which which VFX skills are are most essential and or profitable for a student to be learning at this point? And I, again, I know we said generalist, but are there any clear places where there's you know there's not enough skill or labor force, and it'd be really great for somebody who is young and hungry and practicing with software and and trying to become really good at something to to be able to get a leg up in the space. Um, what I'm I think uh, the ones that are a little bit trickier to join as an intern, actually, that is probably animation and FX. Uh, they are, when you come as an animator, you the, most people have gone an extra animation class just because of that, because they are so angled. That's the only thing they do. And everyone can tell when an animation is bad. So it has to be, so it's going to be hard to get in as an animator, perhaps, if you don't do extra, but I do have friends that came straight from our school where we did everything and he's an animator today. And But otherwise, you know, the little generalist in between that has to do with, like I'm speaking for 3D now, of course, this could also be comp and so on. But for like where you have the little, the little net of different things such as modeling, sculpting, and like the stuff that belongs together, maybe a little bit of rigging and look dev and such. Those, there's always place for people like that. But to come in as an FX person, that's usually very, you know, you work with big files and big explosions. And it can be a little bit trickier to get time to help interns. That being said, I know interns that came like in as FX artists as well. But I would be prepared for the little middle space to be a, a place where it's always needed, these artists. I look at this from a totally different perspective than oh. Evan, but I, I would say, because I'm not an artist, that was an amazing answer, but I would say just be an amazing human being, you know, and ready to learn a uh, bunch of new things. I think that's extremely important also. Yeah, that's actually the most important. So yeah, yeah. well said, <laughs> well added. <laughs> yeah, I think the curiosity, it's make uh, all the difference. Uh, you can see with uh, interns who comes here, the, the curious one is the one who will learn the the most. And, and you, you see that there is uh, then interaction because they're going to have ideas because they're going to, you know, chase information and uh, go on their side as well to, to find some answers or you software sometimes to to help production, for example, a little tool or a little thing. Uh, but even uh, um, as a, a an artist, I think, and uh, production remind people who are uh, curious and and are completely in projects. Yeah, for sure. Cool. cool. One thing I would like to add to this, by the way, uh, when we discussed about how to get an internship or so on, like the one thing that I think is very can be very good to do is if you have a teacher at the school visiting that is teaching in 
sort of the company where you want to come to or so. Like, it doesn't hurt to maintain the contact. And if they have seen you as an eager, excited person and artist, that, that spreads. Like, that, this, this business talks. And uh, when we see happy, excited people, that's getting mentioned. And especially when they apply, the name is already like, oh, that person. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. So, so yeah, was, reach out to teachers and everyone. <laughs> that was really well said. This business talks, and that's true. Yeah, you know, this business yeah. talks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it certainly does. It's a small business. Um, okay, so to just to segue a little bit for the for the producers and and I'd say non students in the audience, and and this is something I'd love to hear from all of you guys also as a producer is what are the things that a a producer can do to avoid number one to make your lives easier um but number two to avoid any big surprises so you know is it is it from the script stage being very mindful about vfx and looping in the the company that they want to be working with so that they can make changes to address a vfx budget um it, it's a it's a long way of saying like as a producer, we're not always thinking about VFX. We're not always thinking about practical. You know, we're usually thinking about, okay, well, what can we make it for? What kind of actors can we get? Who's going to be our sales agents? How are we going to get distribution? All that. And then it, there's a, a tendency to say, we'll deal with post and post. And and that's where a lot of bad, bad things can happen because- The you worst know, you, sentence ever. Exactly. <laughs> and that's, so, so Lynn, I want you to, to weigh in on that because there's a lot of, we'll fix it in post, we'll deal with it in post. Yeah. And I'm sure that's a nightmare for you guys. So, you know, when when is it best to, to be looped in, to be a part of the process, to be making these decisions about practical, shooting practical versus VFX um, and, and you know, as opposed to being told at the end of the day, okay, great, we shot our film and, and now we have to fill in these plugs, help us do it. As soon as there is a, um, a script, actually, uh, when we we can read it and already have, you have to project yourself as well about how the things are going to be shot. And it's always the good moment, of, uh, I think, uh, when uh, production can uh, talk with us because I feel like it's an idea to say that they fix it at the, at the end and it's more like uh, uh, only a technical uh, uh, thing, but actually we can avoid so many, uh, not um, like, uh, we can avoid some, uh, clean VFX, for example, like uh, just clean some some stuff here and there. If, for example, at the beginning you can already talk and, and uh, sit on a table, and sometimes have the opportunity to uh, talk with uh, the other um, people from the, the the shooting team, like the the DOP or the the set guys, then you can find as well sometimes some solutions where uh, they can it can be like crazy to to shoot and uh, then even the, the small things can be avoided actually and this money of all those little cleans avoid then you can put it somewhere else where it's going to be really interesting to to have the vfx because for sure you can't do it on set so it's always uh, good, I think, to to talk, even if sometimes there is a question, the client knows that they can contact us uh, and and uh, ask their, uh, their, their the the problem they can uh, they can find. So we can help them as well to to uh, to to find solutions. Uh, it's not um, how I'm gonna say that. Uh, the, the, the VFX work can be prepared as well during the shooting. But as soon as everything is shot, for sure, even us, we can be a bit uh, locked uh, in uh, the, the, the way to work. Uh, so, um, yeah, as soon as something is writing, I think that uh, we can uh, give ideas. Because even sometimes clients don't see things how we can make things and we can as well so we have good artists and supervisor who can propose ideas uh and it's always great when there is this uh, uh communication uh to to create together 
Yeah, I would say that if you're thinking about it, it was yesterday when you should contact the VFX facility. It's like yeah. as soon as soon as possible. It's like even though if we if we don't have anything else than the script, you know, we can make a breakdown out of it. You can compare like if the budget is tight, you can compare which is cheaper or more like, let's say, better way to do this, like, is it practical or VFX? And just communicate, Op like, be open for everything is like, I think there shouldn't be any secrets. Is it the budget wise, uh, schedule wise, like, whatever wise, it's like, just communicate. And the most important thing for me, at least, it is that there are no stupid questions, you know. Just ask, 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 whatever there is. Like if you have anything on your mind, just shoot it away. It's like we, we are here to help you and make the make the production as smooth as possible from our perspective. So that's why we are here. And and like asking questions a lot. Yeah. And so if I come, here's an interesting real world question for you guys. If I come to you as a producer and I say, hey, I have this like action sequence and my director doesn't believe that it's going to look good from VFX, but I know that if we do it VFX versus practically, we can do it for half as much. How do we collectively demonstrate or convince the filmmaker that, yes, we can make this look real and just as good or close to just as good as, as it would have been if you shot it practically? Um, is there do you guys actually do the work to to start previsioning and showing what things can look like? Is that outside of the scope of work and it's more of just showing past examples of things that you guys have worked on? Um, but for, for me, this is interesting because as a producer, so often the director wants to do things practically, which can just kill the budget. And, and you, you know, you may never get what you're trying to do practically on the day when you go to shoot it. It, how how do we how do I as I as a producer come to you guys and say hey let's show our director that this can be done? I I think it's based on like past experience. It's like we have if we have similar similar stuff that we can show so to you and for for producer also it's it's good to know that if you're doing doing it as practical it's like you usually have like one shot and that's it. And if it doesn't work, then it comes to VFX. And if you compare those, those like for example, money-wise, how it's expensive it, it will be to shoot it. And in VFX, you have more possibilities to to make it. And like you pretty much have like endless possibilities in VFX. Of course, it's related to your budget, but still, I think it's again in this case, it's it's about open communication. You know, and gaining the trust from our side also for the production side, and I think in that that case, like a previous experience from same kind of situations helps. Maybe we can show like animatics from there how it's done in the previous things and all that stuff because it's something that we can share. But if we are doing something totally new, then it's it's quite difficult to show you something that we haven't done. So then it's all related to trust, I think. Yeah, makes sense. Makes sense. So another question from one of the students, what kind of VFX work is mostly demanded nowadays? And how do you guys see that changing in the future? We talked about AI a little bit, but I think this is, this is a question from somebody who is thinking, okay, I've been studying VFX. I, I have different things I can learn. Where is the most demand for, for a new artist entering the game? Um, and how can I be the most helpful and um, in demand coming into the workforce? That's a tricky one. I think, I mean, there's a lot of VFX now. So I would say everything. Like, I don't, there's nothing that is really much more in demand than anything else, I think, unless it's a very like died out old thing, whatever that could be. But no, I would say everything. There is literally, all kinds of VFX going on now. We have set extensions, or the, sometimes it's magic, or sometimes it's destruction, and it's just everything all at once. Nothing more than another. Makes sense. Makes sense. And and here's a, a thing I want to touch on, which I think is really interesting, and I wanted I want to I want to understand. So the pandemic obviously made the world a lot smaller. And, and I think for both of your companies, 
brought in a lot more international opportunities. Um, but I want to hear a little bit about just, and again, sorry to, to make this troll focused, Solane, but just based on the, the audience, how basically, how have you seen the demand go up for international productions and how do the VFX budgets um, compare on a domestic production versus an international production? I know that could be wide ranging, but you know, are, are you are you seeing VFX budgets on international productions that are bigger than an entire budget for a finished film? Are you seeing are you seeing that finished films have healthy VFX budgets? And I think this is part of just answering for producers who are trying to gauge the workflow. And then the second part of that question is, how do you decide two projects come in, an international project comes in that might be, you know, bigger budget and more money to the company, a domestic project might come in that is really exciting and interesting, but, you know, smaller, how do you decide and obviously your your bandwidth is limited. How do you decide how to balance those things based on your standing in the marketplace as a Finnish company? I think it's like, of course, it's it's so that the uh, the bigger budget for VFX comes from abroad. But there's also more to do. It's, I think it's like, and if, if we are comparing uh, international and local projects, the scale can go closer. You know, it's like if there is half a mil or one million euros in a bigger international project, it can be 100,000 in a Finnish production, but we are doing less. And I think that I have past year, I have seen some amazing stuff that we haven't be, even been involved, but how this money is, uh, money is so well spent for the production. You know, it's like, so don't try to go too big if you don't have money because you, you get caught. From that it's just like so understanding the scale what what is what they are doing i think it's extremely important also yeah and maybe i forgot most of the question at this point <laughs> but i think it's like it's going the right direction and in general it's like how 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 the vfx is 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 well what how, how would i put it it's like how it's understood here and how how the production and producers can use the VFX budget. Of course, you have to be more creative. And then the question for big international uh, versus smaller local one, I think it's like our company policy in a way is that it doesn't matter of the scale of the work and how big it is and how much there is money. It, it It's just about scheduling. You know, if we can do it, we will do it. And there are many cases that the smaller ones are more interesting and more challenging. And of course, we are looking also our artists like what they want to do is like if it's more challenging for them and they are more eager and they feel it that it becomes their own project it's always the best for the projects and i have heard that there are massive vfx productions in the world that are not that nice you know it's like it, it, it trains the artist and they they have to work extremely hard conditions and all that some stuff but still it's like it's not first come first sir but it's more like uh we don't take more than we can chew you know it's like i think that's the key thing and we we want to give our 100 percent for the job what we are working on it doesn't matter where it, where it comes from yeah that's really interesting um question for all three of you guys and this is a artist question but not a vfx artist question for for a screenwriter for a filmmaker director for a, for a producer, what should they be thinking about in the development of a script, of a screenplay, as it relates to VFX? Should they be writing whatever they think is the best story and, and just deal with the VFX implications later? Is there training or knowledge that they can get to, you know, to, to write it in a way that makes your jobs easier and, and makes the, the VFX budget more feasible, which would make the whole budget and the possibility of the movie getting made more uh, more likely or more realistic um, from it. So it's not from a VFX hat, it's more from a creative storyteller hat as a writer director or writer director hybrid um, and producer who's developing a script with a writer or writer director. Should VFX be entering the equation in the development stage? And if so, how? That's a tricky one. I have to say it's like because nowadays when you're writing, you can go as crazy as you want to, you know, because you can do pretty much everything what you can dream of. 
and and of course it depends it's like what kind of what are the possibilities for the budget for the film is like is it going to be a local or international and how much they're going to raise money and it's just it's different but i i think it's in generally my opinion is like you shouldn't i would i say it like uh, hold back your creativity in a way it's just like go crazy and of course it's not cool if someone shoots you down and says that it's this is way too expensive but then then it's another creative process to to make it work you know if the budget is not enough for vfx so so i think it's like after that it's like don't hold hold you yourself back when you're writing or uh, dreaming about the film and after that it's like let's deal it later and let's try to make it the best possible solution for everyone regarding vfx yeah, and it's again it's it's a, it's again it's like after that everybody it's about the communication and just like trusting your vendor and be open to negotiate about things and not just like look the final number and say yes or no always like ask how everything is done and what we can do more and if we swap this money to this scene how can we get something more if we ditch this one and all that stuff yeah yeah, I'm joining you. Like as I say uh, later, then it's uh, always a, a pleasure to uh, to to communicate. And uh, you know, if you put all the ideas on the paper, and uh, then you you see already uh, and take the the temperature, because sometimes you you don't, of course, as a when you're writing things, see all the the backstage, let's say. Uh, but then we always can try to find solutions uh, to see first if everything is really important as well in, in the story telling or in where we are, the, the the director or the, the the scripts are going and then of course we can uh, share ideas to see for what it can be done in practical and then to uh, avoid to be done in, in uh, vfx and then to to you know reduce the the list and at the end you can have what you what you had in mind. And also editing can be important because uh, it's another cut, another um, way to, to tell a story. And then you can as well have a, a different way to, to turn a, a scene and then you can make the trick like this. And I also, I would add, that's extremely good answer, but I also would like to add that don't be afraid of the first number that you get in a budget. Yeah. Yeah. Been, I have yeah. been in a situation that we have cut it in half, you know, and we didn't lose anything because usually the first VFX breakdown, it's our take on the matter. It's like it's from our perspective and we usually consider it so that let's put here everything what is doable with VFX. You know, and usually it's like it's always it's it's too big to budget. But after that, we start cutting it down and it doesn't mean that the, the movie is becoming worse or we are losing something. It could be even better that we just throw some stuff away and do it in practical or something else. Yeah. So, Lene, have you worked with, um, have you worked on any projects with Finland? Uh, actually, not personally, but I know that uh, we had some and uh, some are coming actually uh and uh yeah we we work uh, as well on a project uh uh yeah a couple of projects uh are in um linked with uh all the north let's say yeah the great, the great north of the wall <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah yeah it was yeah. always uh, nice and great to 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 work on those productions actually yeah yeah, I was going to ask you how, and and you haven't worked on any of those specifically, but I know you know hatching. I think was worked on with you media, um, and uh, and just wanted to hear. Maybe you don't have the answer for this, but you know how how Finland has positioned itself, and and you know I guess you could say with the Nordics how how those experiences have gone versus some other places. Are have they been smooth? Have they been um, have they been easier? Have they been harder? Have they been more transparent, less transparent? Um, and, and again, if you, if you don't have enough use case, then we don't have to answer that one. But if you do, it could be interesting to hear how the experiences with the Nordics and Scandinavia gone. 
Uh, yeah, well, actually, uh, we already uh, uh, worked on uh, the the bombardment, uh, which takes place uh, in in Copenhagen and with uh, Nordisk film, and uh, it was pretty pretty smooth and really nice to to work on uh, this uh, this project. Um, it's always nice because I feel it's a, bo a board, but not too far from us as well. So it's exactly the the you know a nice mix between the the domestic and international projects, I'll say. Um, and um, yeah, it's it was always nice and smooth uh, working uh, working with them. Uh, and from what I heard for the other project, um, was pretty good as well. Uh, then I can't go too much in details, uh, but uh, yeah, it was all, always a pleasure. Great to hear. And then Auntie Eliana, conversely, for you guys, what does, so Finland has come a really long way in the last couple of years, obviously working on, from a VFX point of view, obviously from an entirely audio visual sector point of view, there's been a ton of progress, especially in Tampere, but um, would love to hear from you guys about you know what? What do you think? What do you think is needed in the future to position Finland even more as a leader in the VFX space? Is it, you know, is it is it more workforce? Is it more artists? Is it, you know, what 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 is it that you? Because you guys are in a a really interesting spot now, having worked on a lot of big local films, now a lot of big international films. Um, you know, what what do you guys see as? What is a missing ingredient or the to phrase it more positively what is the next step that that really puts finland in the forefront of the vfx space hmm. that's a tricky one i think it's like uh we are on the right path you know we are going the right direction and and i, I think it's like uh uh our, our biggest challenge at the moment is the artists to get local artists to work work here in in Finland, and but other than that, I, I, I this this is this might sound a little bit crazy, but I think it's like it, it's kind of like a train at the moment. You know, it's it's on a track and it's going to the right direction. I think it would be nice to be able to collaborate more with Finnish Finnish facilities also and kind of join forces. You know, uh, and, until we are big enough to handle bigger projects also here up north and. But that's pretty much it. I think it's like overall, if we are talking about Nordics, there is, uh, it's like uh, I think there is. Uh, let's say that there is a good respect for towards Nordic VFX. I think the quality here is extremely good. There are good companies here in Sweden, Norway, Denmark, and none of them have that many. I think. But still, like, but the direction is good, and I think it's. We also communicate between the companies, and we have no secrets, and we like to share our challenges and good things also between each other. So I think I I, I see it more like a Nordic thing that is happening here, at least. No, no, no. Yeah. And 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 it's it's amazing to be a part of it, and yeah. But I think it's like growing bigger. That's that's the main challenge for us, you know, to to serve all the production and production houses needs what they need for their films. Yeah, I would say something similar and also like um, right now, it doesn't really matter where where in the world the VFX is like handed out because we can be everywhere and there is a huge good reputation about the quality of the work that comes from like Nordics and so on. So it's like keep delivering quality and, you know, that's that's a good goal to have because then then they will come. <laughs> everyone wants to everyone wants to have quality on their VFX, and now there's a lot of studios to choose from. So you definitely want to. Mm. Yeah, and I think that's that's a nice way to say it, Elin. And I think that goes back to that that we don't want to take more work in that we can handle. You know, mm. it's like uh, yeah, you don't want to be a rotating machine, just pushing stuff no. out. No. Yeah, it's it's the quality, not the quantity. Exactly. Pretty much. And I think mm. Nordics are famous for that. And yeah. I think like every client you have sort of that comes to these companies, they will tell you exactly that we're here for the quality. Like, I think that's a great ethos to have. And, and I think that's exactly in from XYZ's experience working both with you media and also with Troll has been the quality over quantity, you know, the, the ability to 
get on a phone call and and speak to exactly who you need to speak to, who is focused on the project, um, and and not overextended working on a hundred different things. I think that's that's been that's a hallmark for why both of these companies are are leaders in the space right now. Um, last question I'm going to ask before we hand it over to the Q and A with Fani, but these these LED volume screens, um, you know, we have one in Helsinki now, and and I know that. I don't know what the situation is in Belgium, but what are, what are you guys seeing with those? What are the challenges and opportunities that come with those in terms of making your jobs easier or harder? And from my point of view, I've been working on so far two projects with this sort of uh, setup. And what you gain from it is fantastic looking light in the scenes. It looks very, very real. Um, I remember one issue one time that was a few years ago, but uh, there was also this beautiful like these screens were also coming from above and what we were working on like like or in these shots they had also filmed these little guys with helmets and it was very clear there's a square reflection in this helmet from the sky LEDs so it's like that felt like a downside you know that we could see edges and had to clear that up but as I said this was a, lot, a while ago uh, but the light it's super super nice to work with and it is really cool when they actually move the camera and the backgrounds are following that camera it's like you only have to like put together a little piece of ground or something to really like make everything sit in there you don't have to do the green screen work it's just like it's just like you want it already yeah i think yeah. it's like it's pretty much when we were talking about ai you know when when the LED screens came and everybody was like, this is the new future of the VFX and the Rainmaker and whatever. But it's I think it's it's gonna be part of the VFX. It's gonna make some some stuff easier. We don't have to do all the driving shots and all that stuff. So it's faster to do there. And it's it's amazing thing to have, I think, in generally. And I, I think it's here to stay for sure. And it doesn't, it's like it makes our life easier also that we can focus on the shots that actually really need vfx and it's again money well spent if you bring the right kind of shots to vfx and we can do some of the stuff uh, front of the screen so it's it's a good thing yeah also i think it, it helps as well uh, when we were saying that uh, vfx can uh, help during shooting actually it was completely the case to bring all the technology uh, and surrounding the, sh the 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 sets, and uh, saying, "Okay, guys, uh, you, you see that we can as well bring things, and uh, it changed a lot of things, even for actors, because yeah, you are not in in front of just a, a green screen. You can uh, have uh, more the idea to to be in in the scene, and uh, I think that it it helps." Uh, lots of uh, people in different stage of uh, the production actually and in the end it's again better quality for the client i think yeah mm -mm. yeah yes all right great thank you guys i think um i want to hand it over to fani now because i believe we got a lot of pre-questions from the the audience and we've got about less than 20 minutes left so uh fani take it from here and um let's bring it home Thank you, and uh, thank you all for the great session at this point. I'm super, super excited and happy. It was more than I could have expected. Well, I didn't expect any less from you. Uh, yeah, like Aram said, uh, I received a bunch of great questions, like more than ever <laughs> during the history of XYZ masterclasses. So I think that um, I will definitely let the participants to ask any uh, questions that may have risen during the session. But if there are no uh, brave ones, I will uh, I will pick randomly a couple of brief uh, questions and just uh, ask them directly uh, from each one of you. And and for those uh, um, for those of you who uses uh, Zoom session first time, just uh, raise hand press the button, raise hand, and I will let you ask the question. And just remember to open the mic. You don't have to open the camera so you can be shy, as we Finns tend to be, and just throw your questions. You can also write it down to the chat chat section, but 
we all love a great chat like spoken so just be brave don't be too excited one at a time one at a time guys one at a time <laughs> one at a time like okay. i said there are no stupid questions just okay shoot. Okay, let's let, let's warm up the situation a little bit, and I will <clears throat> I will pick a question <clears throat> since we have tons of this. Um, one question that I found very interesting is this. This is probably for all of you, uh, but at least Antti, uh, don't hesitate to uh, catch on this one. What kind of aspect should be taken into consideration in the screenwriting process recurring VFX? Uh, I think I almost answered that question earlier already. It's like when you are writing, it's like just don't think about it, just go crazy. And it's like afterwards we can talk about it and find the right solutions. Because if you are stressing about VFX too much, it could dictate your story, or it's just like not kill, but smaller your creativity in a way. It's just like just go crazy in that point. It's like it doesn't mean that your what you are writing at the moment will be in theaters in next year. So there could be like different kind of new techniques to work on once it's time to shoot it. It's just like let your creativity go crazy. I would say that. And after that, it's like once the script is done, of course, then we can go through it. And it's like it can be pretty much done in two ways is like the, the production underlines all the scenes where they want to have some VFX or we can just determine what we consider could be VFX and start uh, start talking from there. Yeah. yeah, that was a great, great, great answer. And like you said, you kind of answered that already in, in the session, but just wanted to underline underline that one. Yeah, because, absolutely. Yeah, that question actually <clears throat> came up a couple of time, times. Um, Soli, Solen, is there anything you want to add, like, uh, from point of view of a BFX producer, when it comes to pre-production and screenwriting, is there anything you would like to add to Antti's answer? Well, actually, I think that it's, um, good to see VFX not as something that you can just, uh, see and figure out, uh, at the end, uh, once again, like as soon as there is a, a project or something is still good as well to uh, to to talk with us so we can uh, as well give some advices about the time uh, the fix need to 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 do things properly because same like every time well most of the time let's say um, we come with the schedule and then sometimes we just need to fit in this and. It could be a shame sometimes where you, you feel like, well, if we knew that just a bit earlier, we can figure it out and help you a bit more during the preparation or even for us having just an extra time to really like propose you something um, that it could uh, give a little plus, let's say, uh, to, to a scene, for example. So, um, yeah, like... Um, Please, producers and directors and uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, all those people in, in production. Please, like, uh, feel free to 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 contact us. And it's uh, yeah, always a pleasure to 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 share and help uh, even uh, before and uh, share images and ideas together. Mm. Okay, great. Ellen, is there anything you want to add, or do I throw another question? Uh, this is a little bit out of uh, what I'm doing, but I mean, like with everything, if you enjoy it, that's when it gets good. So if you sit there and have to kill what makes it interesting and just because it should work, I'm not sure the story or any writing or anything will be as good as it should would be if you just went full steam ahead with your dream project. It goes for exactly everything, I would say. <laughs> Yeah, and also I add like don't be shy on budget as well because sometimes even small project can be great because you can even work even more on creativity side and um, 
and at the end sometimes it can be uh, even more fun for our uh, artists to uh, to to try things rather than uh, having really big projects where everything is uh, really tight and you just uh, need to 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 do it and and uh, process a bit uh, even if you add a little thing but i mean you have less um opportunity to as well catch a little thing and uh, sometimes uh, it's always a, a pleasure when the, the client uh, is happy about a little uh, ad we can bring. Yeah, everything makes 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 perfectly sense. Um, <clears throat> randomly to pick one if there are no questions from the live audience. Okay, two hands raised. Let me check. <clears throat> okay, and here we go. Emily, please ask your question. Hi all. Uh, thanks for your thanks for the good conversation. Just like to know what what keeps you uh, inspired and motivated in the business. Do you have something, some movies you see that you re feel really excited and want to try? those things yourselves in the future projects or yeah what keeps you what keeps you motivated in the business well for me at least uh it is the fact that there's a lot of variation going on so you always have to learn like whenever you need to do a new project you always need to figure out how to do it and that means talk to people look at references absolutely watch movies for inspiration but that's at least for me, what gets like gets me going, like just it's so it's a, such a fun business, just because you get to do so much, <laughs> so different stuff. Yeah, definitely, a project is uh, never the same, even if it's more or less the the same topics. Uh, well, first, it's always a different way to shoot it, uh, and also uh, the. the Every time I'm fascinated about how crazy we can uh, and and we can we can go and uh, I would say like a specialist. Uh, for example, we we had this movie in the Second World War and we made so much research on uh, a specific um, uh, plane to to animate it, and uh, we knew which uh, engine it was inside and. Uh, <laughs> all like a little piece of uh, of it and uh, how see watch a lot of footages and and then you you can have a conversation taking uh, talking about uh, planes in the second war uh, and then you're gonna jump on another project completely different with uh, magic or a crazy creature and you're gonna try to make a mix between how those big birds gonna fly and those uh, uh, like mix this uh, with uh, crocodiles for example and to, to create something new and you have to make it so realistic that at the end you need to to be expert at the end <laughs> yeah I, I have to agree it's like I, I think every project is, is it's a different one it's always a new one and it's like the variation of stuff what you do and what you can learn it's like <laughs> I never knew when I came to this industry, we did this TV series that was shot in Chile, in Santiago, that I know so much about the history of the city and all the old buildings. It's just like, it's crazy because you have to do the research for that stuff, what, what was where and when. So it's, it's, it's just mind blowing, I would say, like the industry and how much more you can also learn than just the industry and what you do for VFX. Like, like you say, like what kind of engines are in warplanes and you don't easily start to read about that stuff so but you can you can learn quite a lot yeah yeah i would just add for, from my point of view just pushing the envelope and and enabling our filmmakers that we work with to to be able to you know realize and actualize their vision so you know i think that's the the coolest thing for me um project by project in terms of staying motivated and staying hungry is um is is getting really attracted to a, a piece of material and a filmmaker and that coupling and trying to figure out how to how to make that as good as possible for the world to enjoy that that's the number one thing as far as the north star good question by the way thank you thank you emily 
Okay, uh, we have next one, uh, Titania. I just allowed you to ask a question, so please. Oh, sorry. Um, so I I was gonna just say that the I think the chat box is disabled or something. So I just wanted to let you guys know in case that was an issue. Sorry, <laughs> but um, since since I'm here, I I don't have any strict questions because I have I'm waiting for my bus right now. But I just wanted to take the time quickly to thank all of you for taking the time to you know talk talk with us about these things and show us these things. It's been really insightful and helpful and I appreciate it. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. That's yeah, thanks. <laughs> nice of you flagging. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Titania. Thank you so much. We actually know personally and, and, and she, she's one of the most, most uh, like excited and energetic new talents coming from. Oh somewhere. my God. <laughs> <laughs> Just keep, keep up the good work. Okay. Thanks. Um, any other questions from the audience? We still have five minutes left. If I were you, I would definitely take advantage of this expertise that we have here. Okay, here we have. Okay, Mikko, please. <clears throat> hello, hello. Hi, Mikko. Mikko. Hey, hey, this is Mikko from lamp factory and um, for the aram uh, it's actually we have two led studios in here in helsinki one is one of one is mine <laughs> so, oh, cool. so okay, the, yeah just a piece of information hey i'm i would like to know do you do you see a need or demand for 3d scanning for example like actors photogrammetry scan services is there many of those companies that offer those kind of services at the moment uh i can jump in here yes uh, 3d scanning uh, absolutely like you might not use the model of the 3d scan but there's so much info in there you have the colors of the clothes and the skin and the hair yeah. and like so it's absolutely something that has a lot of use in the industry and um, even yeah because then you just read topo you make a new model that can be rigged but there's so much to fetch yeah. from those scans. Yeah, I think okay. also it's like ladies today. Uh, I was in a meeting that the production said that all the actors are 3D scanned. So it's always it's, okay. it's useful use for us. Like if we need to explode, for example, one of the actors and it, it helps quite a lot. So no one gets hurt. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it's 100% correct proportions like usually what you get is them spinning around and you while you're taking different photos so it definitely like having one static geo to base everything on it spits it up and it gives you everything yeah yeah do you see a lot of studios here here at the scandinavia like uh that gives that sort of services at the moment I personally haven't seen super much of it, but uh, I've seen it come along, I think, uh, absolutely. But it's always super, super different. And every project that I work with comes from different places. And yeah. so I don't have a perfect answer to that, but I know that we as VFX studio would probably be very happy if that came to yeah. us. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Find exactly. a market fit here, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, cool. Thanks for the answer. Thanks. Any others? Okay. I think that I think that the pressure pressure has slowed down. Well, let's let's wrap up the session, but I would like to ask the final question, and I also want to set a perfect vibe for the end. And I would love to hear from each one of you, uh, Aram, you can also, also join, what makes your job the best job in the world? And let's go with ladies first. So, Solen, you can start with this one. Uh well, actually, it's joining a bit what I was uh, 
I was saying earlier, like for me, uh, I really like every time that it's so a project is so different, and at the end you have to uh, investigate in so different uh, uh, topics. And also every time it depends on the director's point of view and direction. So even the same subject can be really different. And uh, and then you you can have as well all this uh, this connection with uh, with artists and when you build the team with uh, uh, the head of production and uh, VFX supervisor, you straight away catch who uh, who will have uh, the the little things to to catch straight away uh, the the direction to take, and uh, yeah, it's 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 great to 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 create uh, all together and uh, yeah and and making things abroad is extraordinary extraordinary as well like uh, working on a project where someone is in uh, New Zealand the production is in uh, Germany and Los Angeles and uh, the supervisor of all is in UK and like at the end you feel like uh, it's a really small word so uh, yeah it's always uh, every day it's not the same actually and it's great Yeah, um, for me, I mean, I actually struggled with finding what I wanted to do exactly for some time. Like, I love making creatures, but I also like love making shots and so on. But what I discovered was that what I love the most is this like super tight team problem solving, making everything look nice together. And uh, like as a lead here or that does not mean I'm bossing around, but it means I'm there to support and work with everyone. And as a very social person, it's, yeah, that makes my day every time we have intense days, just solving, solving, solving and figure out and no. And on top of that, you know, get results that are so beautiful and you're so happy with that. So it's like, you really get to feel both the creative and the social. Yeah, and I would say that for me, the most important thing is like, or fascinating thing is to, be surrounded by creativity and creative people and just seeing things to come to life generally is like creating whatever is like and see the great boxes and see the see the end result that's that's always amazing and yeah but i, I would say the creativity that's the thing for me yeah i would echo that i think at the end of the day for me the the most interesting thing is the the creative process, being able to um, work with great filmmakers and also, you know, everyone on this call, um, being able to have this network of really cool, smart, creative people um, around the world who who I'm able to tap into and on a case by case basis work with to help filmmakers realize their vision and and hopefully have that vision be seen and appreciated by an audience. That's that's super exciting and. Um, you know, it gives it gives me a lot of gratitude and, and also satisfaction to to be able to be a part of that. So yeah, that's that's it for me. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. And I personally want to thank City of Tampere and my colleagues Rahkonen, Ilkka, and Toivian and Antti for being the best best colleagues and making my job the best best in the world. Uh, thank you, funders. Thank you, collaborators. Uh, Thump, especially. And thank you, Solen. Thank you, Elin. Thank you, Antti. Thank you, Aram. And thank you, audience, for great questions and for your in interactive being in general. Thank you so much. And, and I think we are done here. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs>